This is Intelligence Matters, sponsored by Ginkgo Biosecurity, whose cutting-edge biological intelligence platform empowers national security decision-makers to identify and respond to emerging biological threats. Steve Bauscher is the president and CEO of Incutel, where he directs and implements Incutel's mission of identifying, evaluating, and leveraging commercially available technologies for the national security community. He has been with Incutel since 2006, succeeding Chris Darby in 2023 as CEO. Steve has over 30 years of business experience with an extensive background in emerging technologies and venture capital. We'll be right back with Steve in a discussion about venture, technology, and national security after a quick break. I'm Andy McCretis, and this is Intelligence Matters. Biosecurity matters. What's biosecurity? It's the mission-critical industry safeguarding against 21st century biological threats. Biology doesn't respect borders. Ginkgo Biosecurity monitors critical assets and produces actionable biointelligence for national security decision makers confronting biological threats, whether they are natural, accidental, or malicious. Ginkgo's technology tracks deadly pathogens worldwide, and our globally scaled platform, the first of its kind, detects outbreaks in near real time, deploys AI-powered threat assessments, and identifies the source of a threat, mitigating outbreaks before they become national emergencies. When lives and livelihoods are on the line, every second counts. Ginkgo Biosecurity, the biosecurity partner for an uncertain new era. Learn more at biosecuritymatters.com. Welcome back. Steve, welcome to the podcast. Uh, Great to have you on. Uh, Why don't we start with you telling us a little bit about yourself and then maybe tell our listeners what InQtel is, how and why it started. I know it started when George Tenet was the director of of CIA, but maybe you can give us a little bit of the backstory. Sure, thanks Andy. I'm thrilled to be here, first of all. uh, my own background, uh, I've been at Inkytel for 17 years, as you know. Uh, I spent most of that time as the number two person at Inkytel, with Chris Darby being the CEO. When Chris stepped down last year, the board saw fit to promote me, and uh, 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 I've been leading the organization ever since. Uh, previous to coming to Inkytel, I was a general partner for eight years at InterWest Partners, a more traditional venture capital firm. Uh, before that, I uh, worked for three startup companies. I like to joke, one went out of business, one got bought, one went public. So, oh, I so had that, that fits the pattern, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. It, uh, it's the whole spec. <laughs> only only one, one of those three things can happen. I got uh, uh, one of each. Uh, uh, and, and before all that, I grew up in Washington, D.C. with my dad working for the U.S. government for 20 years. So uh, it was an opportunity when the Incatel opportunity came up to uh, bring both parts of my life together. Part of my life growing up in D.C. with not just my dad, but a lot of my friends' parents working for the government. Uh, and then being out in uh, Silicon Valley since 1992, working with startup companies in some form or another. Incutel, as, as, as you point out, was founded uh, 25 years ago in 1999, so we're celebrating our 25th anniversary this year. Uh, and it was founded by George Tenet, uh, uh, Buzzy Krongard, Sue Gordon, Joanne Isham, a set of people uh, uh, at CIA, who uh, uh, had this uh, premise, which was controversial back then and much more readily accepted today, that innovation has shifted in the United States from large corporate R&D labs like Xerox Park and Bell Labs to the 10,000 plus venture backed startup companies in the United States. And CIA used to be able to go in in places like Xerox Park and Bell Labs and say, show me the latest and greatest stuff that you're working on, and they'd show it to them. And then CIA could also sort of say, wow, that's really cool, but you know what? If you add an encryption to it or made it compatible with this version of scientific Linux that only CIA uses anymore, or you know, make some sort of small modification or feature change, we could really consume it more easily. And those uh, organizations would make those uh, 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 product changes because the U.S. government was a large customer of their parent organization. And so when CIA created us, they created us not just to identify the innovation that was occurring in those uh, companies, but they also asked us to do two other things. One is try and figure out some way to uh, 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 allow us to influence the product direction and then also figure out some way for us to ingest that technology and really deploy it in mission operational environments. And that's what Inkytel was really created to do. We've been doing it for 25 years and we think we do it well. Uh, We think we do it well. And now we do it at scale in that we work not just with CIA, but we work with 10 different US government agencies. And we'll get to this, I think, later on in one of your questions, but we also work with the uh, the UK and the Australian governments as well. Uh, So Steve, you know, given the evolving national security landscape that that you sort of just described 
if we're talking about today, what, what emerging technological threats do you see as the most concerning? And then maybe as a second part, how is InQtel strategically adapting its investment portfolio to dr address those threats and opportunities and sort of looking around the, around the corner yeah. uh, kind of thing? Well, I think to, to the first part of your question, um, everything we look at we see as both a threat and an opportunity, right? You know, uh, 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 new emerging technology provides an opportunity for someone to take advantage of it, right? And the question is, is the adversary going to take more advantage of it or are we going to take more advantage of it? And that's what we feel like we're you know, put in place to do is help our U.S. government agencies take more f uh, 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 full advantage of these new technologies than our adversaries are doing. Um, I'd point out, uh, uh, I think about the new technologies in a couple of different ways. At the application level, I think there are two uh, uh, technologies in particular that we're paying a bunch of attention to. On the software side, it's generative AI, right? Uh, uh, and generative AI uh, has gotten a lot of hype and a lot of uh, um, uh, uh, buzz in, in the market, but there's no question that it's going to have impact on decision making, which is hugely important to the agencies we work with, and, and it's also going to have a uh, 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 huge impact on uh, and just how information is projected, right? Uh, 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 this whole concept of deep fakes and misinformation and propaganda uh, are, are going to get amplified and accelerated by, uh, 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 the techno by the generative AI technology, and that's a huge threat and potentially an opportunity uh, for us. On the hardware side, the big uh, technology we are exploring is uh, drones and counter drone uh, uh, technology, and you're seeing that, I think, in the conflict in Ukraine and the conflict in the Middle East, where uh, um, uh, commercial technology-based drones are shrinking the gap between uh, what I characterize as traditional Goliaths of the world and the traditional Davids of the world. So uh, no one expected Ukraine to be able to uh, 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 defend itself and compete uh, on a uh, military basis with Russia the way it has been over the last couple of years. And they have leveraged uh, uh, drone technology to do that tremendously, and they've worked on counter drone uh, 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 technology as well. Similarly, uh, Hamas took advantage of commercial technology based drones to uh, 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 sort of defeat the Israeli air defense uh, uh, systems and, and execute the attack on uh, October 7th. So, uh, uh, those are two uh, technologies at the application level that I think we're spending a lot of time with. And I think if you think about any sort of conflict in the South China Sea going forward here, those technologies are going to be hugely influential in terms of uh, 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 what happens there. Now, in order to um, uh, uh, deploy and implement both those technologies, you have to look at two p places in the underlying infrastructure as well. So microelectronics is a huge uh, 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 area of innovation and, and, and competition uh, right now. And if you want to deploy generative AI, one of the things you've learned is that it's hugely uh, compute intensive, right? And, and if you look at the amount of money that uh, X, uh, just raised for XAI, uh, the uh, 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 generative AI uh, company that uh, the Elon Musk ecosystem, if you will, is uh, 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 launching. Uh, I think a lot of that uh, money they just raised, I think $6 billion, a lot of money is going to go to build this huge compute farm that they've talked about. Similarly, a lot of the Microsoft money that's going into open AI is to build a huge compute uh, uh, farm for them. And so continued innovations on the hardware layer to figure out how you run the, all the computational uh, uh, um, uh, uh, workloads that you need to do to, to uh, deploy and take advantage of generative AI is a big important thing uh, uh, going forward here in the microelectronics space. Similarly, a lot of investments in advanced energy, because when you have these huge data centers and have these huge compute farms, they become uh, 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 large uh, uh, users uh, and consumers of energy. And so all the big data centers around the world are now thinking about where they locate themselves as it relates to cheap, affordable, uh, uh, and abundant energy sources. And, and so we're investing in both the microelectronics and the uh, energy, advanced energy areas tremendously. The fifth area of technology I'll point out is a wild card, and that's bio. And you know, China's on record right now as sort of saying Europe won the Industrial Revolution in the 19th century, the U.S. won the Information Revolution in the 20th century. We, China, want to win the bio revolution in the 21st century. And I think not enough people are paying attention to uh, things that are being developed uh, uh, in engineered biology and synthetic biology, and how that might have impact beyond just healthcare and the way we uh, 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 treat, you know, and. Uh, 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 maintain our, our health, but uh, it's going to have a huge impact in uh, uh, energy, it's going to have a huge impact in agriculture and food, uh, and, and I think 
the, bi the 21st century will be the biocentry, and I think uh, uh, because of that, uh, we're actually taking a, a small amount of our investing efforts and applying them to the, to the bio area to help our customers understand where that technology is going. So just two quick follow-up sure. points on, on, the, on the bio side. You know, that I, I think you're right, but, but there's also, that also creates bio threats. Yes. Right, and, and well, look, we've just sort of all lived through what a bio threat is, and that's right. the, you know, the pandemic. Um, and however that came about, that, that's not the point, but it, it can have a significant national security impact, uh, let alone engineered pathogens or, or whatever. So early detection, being able to understand, you know, the, the, the environment around us is going to become more critical. A absolutely. Early detection, uh, big data analy analytics to track. You know, one of the things that happened in the pandemic at the first beginning was we realized we had very poor systems in place to track, you know, who had it, what the results were, you know, that sort of stuff. And then, um, uh, 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 the third thing I, I, I would say there is um, uh, rapid vaccination and rapid uh, uh, tools to deploy uh, uh, whatever potential uh, countermeasures uh, uh, we, we might develop. So, so the, the challenge for us is, quite frankly, and, and you probably experienced this as well, is when we talk to folks in the government agencies we work with and sort of say, we think bio is a big problem that people aren't paying enough attention to, they all agree with us, but then they sort of say, but it's not really my job. I'm not sure whose job it is. 100%. 100%. It seems to fall a little bit of a crack. Right. Exactly. Right? Exactly. And so what we've done historically, and this is the beauty of being an independent, not-for-profit, a 501c3, so a little bit separated from the government, uh, uh, is uh, uh, we sometimes see things that we think are falling into cracks, and we just sort of say, okay, you know, we're going to go ahead and start investing in that area to try and help educate our partner agencies on uh, uh, what's going on there. And that's what we're doing in bio. And we're working with you know, various peoples and various organizations to, to try and help them understand it better so they, they can hopefully figure out whose job it should be, right, and, and who should be focusing on it. Just one other quick follow-up sure. yeah. on AI because, you know, so, yeah. so you live in this environment. And there's a lot of smart people who are ringing the bell that, that AI could um, cause serious harm. Yep. Um, how, how do you think about all that? So um, I think what you talk about is the phrase responsible AI, right? You know, that, 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 that's sort of the buzzword. Um, uh, and I think, um, I think the industry itself uh, uh, has its own efforts to, um, uh, to try and sort of self-regulate, you know, and uh, uh, be smart and thoughtful about it. And I'm encouraged by a lot of the conversation that's going on within the industry. I think the U.S. government is uh, 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 thinking through its role there. I'm always a little cautious of government's ability to be an effective regulator of a new emerging technology area because it takes a while for the world to figure out what this technology is all about and what its opportunities and threats are and therefore what the appropriate uh, uh, regulations you know, are. And I can't think of an example of an early new technology where uh, government tried to regulate it and did it appropriately or, or pr productively. Um, you know, and so I do have some concerns that some people have that, you know, poor regulation will sort of inhibit our ability as a country to uh, uh, move forward in this area, and that leaves an opportunity for our adversary to, to move faster. On the other hand, one thing I don't think is talked about enough is China has their own version of responsible AI that could inhibit them, which is this could be a very powerful to tool for the masses against an authoritarian regime, right? You know, and, and, and so they're going to have their, like, responsible AI is AI that doesn't threaten, you know, our regime's power, right? You know, and, and so they're going to have to think through that. And uh, uh, there's a line that actually uh, uh, someone at your former employee said to me that, that I thought was uh, uh, pretty good, which is in the U.S., uh, 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 we worry about AI hallucinating. In China, they worry about AI telling the truth. That's great. <laughs> you know, That's a great line. <laughs> that is a great line. And, and so uh, um, I think that uh, 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 China has their own issues there. Yeah. So, Steve, you know, collaboration is, is key in tackling some of these complex national security challenges like the ones we just talked about. Can you talk a little bit about Incutel's unique position in fostering these partnerships between startups, the intelligence community, other stakeholders? Yeah. So, so. I think if there's one thing that I'm very proud of Inkytel is that over the 25 years, we have built a trusted set of relationships with everybody in this ecosystem. The entrepreneurs, the investors that, that back them, 
but also the uh, uh, customers at these uh, uh, end agencies. And we sit at this sort of intersection of those Venn diagrams uh, as, as the only organization we think is trusted by all three of those groups and understands what uh, 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 all, all three of them need. You know, I think um, uh, people like to think of us as an investment firm, and I understand uh, 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 why they uh, do that, because that's the mechanism that we, uh, uh, through which we build uh, our relationships and establish connections. But at the end of the day, the insight that I think we've developed over 25 years that's really important to understand is what these startup companies want is not necessarily more investment capital because there's a lot of investment capital out there. What they want is access to customers and ultimately uh, 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 contracts, revenue, and deployed successful uh, 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 installations of their technology. What the agencies want that work work with us is not some sort of return on invested capital that they uh, 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 give to us. What they want is new emerging technologies deployed in mission operational environments to help them execute their uh, 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 missions more successfully. And so with that as the understanding, uh, 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 what we do is we don't just make a, a, a small investment in each of these companies, but we also bring together uh, 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 them in a customer relationship through a contract that we call a work program that allows the end users to influence the product direction as we talked about at, at the beginning. So the end users at one or more of the agencies will work with will say, sort of say, as part of this contract, we'd like you to add this feature or uh, 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 you know, ex uh, uh, modify the technology in this small way to help us take advantage of it. We will be the customer. Inkytel uh, uh, signs a purchase order with these companies and then we help uh, uh, we purchase the technology for the right to deploy a pilot. We will then help the end agency deploy the technology with us at one or more of the agencies we work with. If that pilot period goes well, then the end agency will buy directly from the portfolio company more stuff, more licenses, more gadgets, whatever we sell. We call that an adoption. And success for us, success for our customers on the government side, and success for our portfolio companies on the investment side is when uh, 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 there's now a direct contract between the end government agency and the uh, uh, company to deploy more technology in, in mission operational environments. So I, I'm sure you see this, Steve, but you know, one of the challenges, at least uh, that I've seen, is you know, the government doesn't quite, hasn't quite figured out how to deal with small c companies. Correct. They're, they're yeah. geared towards dealing with the primes that, yep. that they typically deal with. And small companies don't really know how to right. deal with the government. So InQtel f fits in that gap in many ways, right, to sort right. of help both sides understand the other? Yes, exactly. So, you know, think of us from an investment perspective as we're the early stage uh, uh, guys. So we're, we're typically working with companies that have never sold with the government before. 90% of the companies we invest in have never sold to the government before. We, and our specialty is helping those companies understand what features they need to build in their product or technology uh, uh, to serve the government market. We then facilitate the piloting of that technology. Uh, we then coach them on this is what you need to do from establishing a federal sales group, you know, getting on a GSA schedule, understanding what the FAR is, what a COTAR is. You know, they, we, you know the government uses lots of acronyms that are, are completely meaningless and confusing uh, uh, to that. And then uh, uh, we work with the procurement people at the end agency such that if those pilot goes well, they're ready to do a, a direct contract. Uh, 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 with the company. So we sit in the intersection and we bring those two worlds together and oftentimes they, they uh, uh, um, uh, uh, talk past each other. And because we've been doing this for 25 years, we're proven and trusted such that any of the top 25 venture capital firms in the country have eight or 10 successful uh, co-investments with us and they'll tell the current company, hey, trust these guys, you know, listen to them, right? And we're trusted with the agency such that when we say, you know, hey, this startup company that's losing money has 12 months of cash on its balance sheet is gonna be around for a while. It's got good investors, good management team. It's worth your time to sort of make a bet on, on them. Uh, uh, they'll listen to us. At the end of the day, we help companies like Palantir and Anduril and Databricks and FireEye and you know, uh, hundred uh, 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 or multiple hundreds of other companies get their first government customer. That's our sweet spot for us. That's the problem we're trying to solve is how do these startup companies get their first government customer and how do these government customers engage with these companies for the first time? Then if there's success there and everybody's happy, uh, 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 the two sides, uh, uh, we coach the two sides on how uh, 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 to scale that relationship to a larger, uh, 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 broader uh, relationship. I, you know, I guess you can't overstate how daunting it is for a small company when they first faced federal acquisition rules and regulations. Right, it, yeah. 
Right. You know? Well, you know, the, again, the, the the joke we like to say is that you know most uh, uh, startup companies think uh, uh, Kotar, which is a contracting officer in, in government uh, parlance, is a Klingon uh, warrior princess, right? <laughs> you, you know, so so it's, it's starting from that basic uh, uh, level, and. You know, the thing that Washington doesn't always understand about these startup companies is these startup companies are funded in 12 to 24 month periods, right? You know, they have they raise a series of investments, series A, B, C, and, uh, uh, you know, and if you're an entrepreneur or CEO of one of these companies, you're constantly thinking, what do I need to do to show progress to my existing investors to help me raise my next round of financing? And the most tangible form of progress they can demonstrate is a purchase order. And so typically startup companies only want to talk to customers that they think can make a purchase order decision in less than 12 months. The conventional wisdom in the startup world was that that was not the government. That's why that, that world ignored the government for so long. But what the benefit of being one of those early customers from the government perspective is that's how you influence product direction. Right, you know, and so really, it's that problem that we in Cattell solve. It's like how do uh, uh, these companies get a purchase order from a government uh, 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 market in less than twelve months? How does the government be able to influence the product direction of these companies at these early stage to get these great new innovations more tailored or better tailored uh, uh, to to solve their problems? We're going to take a quick break, and we'll be right back with Steve Bauscher. Beacon Global Strategies is the premier national security advisory firm. Beacon works side by side with leading companies to help them understand national security policy, geopolitical risk, global technology policy, and federal procurement trends. Beacon's insight gives business leaders the decision advantage. Founded in 2013, Beacon develops and supports the execution of bespoke strategies to mitigate business risk, drive growth, and navigate a complex geopolitical environment. With a bipartisan team and decades of experience, Beacon provides a global perspective to help clients tackle their toughest challenges. So Steve, of course, the U.S. Um, isn't alone in sort of seeking technological solutions for national security issues. Um, can you sort of describe what Incutel's role is in sort of looking around the world and seeing where other countries are, you know, friends or, or more interestingly, adversaries and what they're investing in and how that plays into your, your strategy and, and your role with the U.S. government? Absolutely. So, um, you know, we started 25 years ago. We started, as you can imagine, investing in Silicon Valley and Boston and Austin and Boulder and Seattle and, you know, the other places in the United States that have uh, uh, great pockets of uh, uh, innovation startup community. Uh, we have now investments, I think, in 38 out of the 50 states. Uh, uh, so, you know, we like to tra track that for Congress. <laughs> uh, uh, um, uh, but, you know, along the way, we start to make investments in such exotic locales as Canada and Great Britain, you know, and, and Australia. And, 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 and so along the way there, uh, because, you know, to, to the point of your question, uh, innovation is not captive to the United States, right? Innovation is occurring all, all over the world. But we're not going to invest in companies that are developed in, in regions where the U.S. government is not going to trust that technology, right? So we're not investing in China. We're not investing in Russia. We're, we're, you know, we're not investing in companies out of those areas. But uh, uh, at some point, maybe s five, six years ago, uh, uh, we realized that we were seeing enough activity outside the United States, 10 to 15 percent of our investments, uh, 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 that we thought it would be good for us to uh, 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 broaden our activity outside the U.S. and, in fact, and establish offices outside the U.S. And we went to CIA and, and, and talked to them, and they sort of said, well, if you want to do this, you should do this in conjunction with uh, 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 our allies, so we don't feel like we're surprising them or you know doing anything like that. And thus was born this idea of Incutel International because we're really creative about our naming uh, 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 systems, right? And so we created a separate fund, Incutel International, that gets money from the UK government, the uh, Australian government, and the US government. And we invest now 10 to 15 percent of our invest activities uh, outside the US. We've expanded into you know, uh, we've made investments in Western Europe. We've made investments in other parts of Asia. Uh, uh, um, again, only in areas where we think the uh, um, uh, uh, government will be comfortable uh, uh, leveraging technologies to de deploy in those countries. But it's been a, a very, um, uh, uh, I think, productive uh, relationship for us. And if you believe that uh, uh, in any sort of nation state competition with China, we need to work not just by ourselves, but with our allies to develop uh, uh, compelling technologies uh, 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 to win this competition. You know, 
it allows us to be just a little bit closer with those countries uh, 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 and a little bit closer uh, uh, in terms of understanding, you know, what is being developed that's interesting in Australia, for example, right? There's a lot of quantum research being done in Australia. There's a lot of GPS denied environment uh, technology being developed in Australia, given their mining uh, uh, stuff. That's interesting. You know, some of the early generative AI stuff came out of uh, uh, research universities in, in the UK. So, so the, each region of the world has sort of, you know, their unique strengths and weaknesses from a technology development perspective. And if we, the you know, U.S. want to be the leaders of a West, some sort of Western democratic uh, uh, tech alliance uh, uh, developed uh, uh, to combat uh, uh, China. We need to be understanding where innovation is occurring in all those uh, different countries. So, but Silicon Valley is sort of at the pinnacle. Yeah. It's, it's still unique. Why hasn't anybody been able to reproduce that? Oh, uh, gosh. Uh, 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 a lot of people have certainly tried, and I'm not sure if I, I, I know the answer. What, what I would say is... Um, uh, I think the table stakes to be a Silicon Valley of X is great research universities, right? And, and Silicon Valley has always benefited from Stanford and uh, UC Berkeley. It also has national labs such as uh, Lawrence Livermore, uh, 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 um, uh, Stanford Linear Accelerator. You know, uh, uh, so there are some. There's a lot of great fundamental research uh, 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 being done there. Now there's great fundamental research done in other places, but you start there. Next thing you do is you need capital. You need capital to invest in these ideas, and, and uh, the Bay Area has always been a, 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 a capital center, uh, if, if you will. But the third thing you need that I think is start where you start to get more unique to, to that area is you need uh, uh, successful companies that are built because this is a pattern recognition business, right? And so when you have an early successful company, the employees at that company sort of say, oh, this is how you build a successful company. Now I want to go do this myself. And they spin off and, and, and they do that. And Silicon Valley has been around long enough that, you know, it's gone through successive and successive generations of that. And it's created a culture that's very tuned uh, uh, to this world. You know, I grew up here in Washington, D.C., as I said, you know, my, my, my dad worked for the government for 20 years and he worked for uh, uh, Arthur Anderson for 25 years, right? So he basically had two employers his, his entire life. You know, I go out to Silicon Valley to go to Stanford. Uh, I, I leave Stanford. I, I go to work for uh, for uh, for business school. I, I leave Stanford and I go to work for a startup company. As I said, the first startup company I went to was the one that went out business. So all of a sudden, two years later, I'm being laid off. Right? That's what happens when a, <laughs> a, a, a startup company goes out business. I'm walking into the San Mateo uh, uh, County unemployment office, right, and following <laughs> uh, following my un unemployment claim. I'm calling up my parents and sort of saying, "Yeah, I'm out of a job." Right? You know, and then my parents are like, "Oh my gosh, this is the end of the world." You know. <laughs> Uh, 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 what's going on here? And meanwhile, in, in, in Silicon Valley, I'm telling my friends this, and everybody's like, "It's happened to me," you know, uh, uh, right? You know, being at a, a failed startup is almost a badge of honor in, in Silicon Valley. And there's an incredibly supportive ecosystem around there. You know, to the, the next thing I know, they're like, "Go talk to these five startup companies," right? And, and that's how I found my next one. That you know, it's the one that got bought, and then you know, uh, 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 that sort of stuff. And so this this culture that's so supportive and uh, uh, encouraging of taking risk, you know, and, and, and not penalizing you for if you have a failed startup on your resume, of, 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 of people being there for you when you have that sort of cold moment of like, oh my gosh, I'm not getting a paycheck next week, you know, uh, 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 what am I going to do? That is, I think, what is really unique about Silicon Valley. And even in some of these other places like Austin, Boston, you know, uh, 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 Tel Aviv, um, um, I don't think it's quite ingrained in the culture in the same ways. And, and, and that is what allows people to, to try these stupid, crazy ideas that turn out to be, you know, uh, 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 every one in a hundred turns out to be this game-changing, life-changing uh, uh, technology company. So Incusel operates um, sort of at the intersection of financial returns and national security. Right. Um, can you talk about the metrics you use to measure success and and then how you prioritize what sometimes may appear to be competing yeah, priorities. Great. Right? So um, in the investment community, there are two types of investors. There are what's uh, characterized as financial return uh, investors. These are investors that are raising money from other people to go make investments. And uh, their success is measured by what's the rate of return that they generate on the capital that they take from these investors, right? So IRR is a uh, very commonly uh, uh, used metric there. And it's just like the 
rate of return people talk about than uh, U.S. stock markets, right? Whether it's New York Stock Exchange or NASDAQ or the S&P 500, right? You know, if the public stock markets generate, on average, over some long period of time, a 7 8% rate of return, the venture capital community is always trying to beat that by 5%, you know? So they, you know, they want to generate 12 13 15% rate, rates of return there. But there's a second set of investors in the venture capital community that are uh, uh, called strategic investors. These are people that are investing on behalf of so larger organizations. So Intel Corporation has a fir firm called Intel Capital. Again, we're creative about naming. And there's a lot of other, every large tech company, a lot of large Fortune uh, 500 companies, we were just talking beforehand about a, a German company, Siemens, that has an investment arm, right? Everyone has an investment arm. But these uh, organizations are, not uh, uh, interested in investing for financial return. They're investing to generate some sort of strategic uh, 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 goal, right? So for example, Cisco, uh, the large networking company used to have, a, or still does have an investment arm, right? And one of the things they want to you know, do, accomplish with their investments is drive the need for more bandwidth because the need for more bandwidth will cause people to want to buy more routers and servers than Cisco sells. So they invested in Netflix, right? Because what, you know, <laughs> what generates the need for more bandwidth more than a, tons of streaming mo movies and videos uh, uh, running around the in internet. So Inkytel has always positioned ourselves as a strategic investor, right? We are not investing for financial return. Our strategic goal is uh, uh, the deployment of mission, uh, of innovative technologies in mission and operational environments. And so we're very clear to our customers, we're very clear to our uh, 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 investments, and that's the uh, motivating force for us. And so while two thirds of the investments we make are probably attractive financial oriented investors, investments that will attract top tier venture capitalists as our co-investors. A third of our investments are in compelling technologies that can help with the mission operational goals of the agencies we work with, but aren't going to uh, uh, be big successes even if they work, right? In the venture capital business as a general rule is a hits driven business. 10% of your investments generate 70% of your returns. And so most venture capitalists want to look at every investment and say, if it works, can it return my fund? You know, uh, 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 sort of thing. And so for those third of, of investments that aren't uh, 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 financially attractive to the venture capital community, we have to find other co-investors that are angel investors or other strategic investors that will want to work with us and, and we're successful in doing that. The key though is for, for a, a compelling technology to turn into a great uh, uh, um, solution for the uh, agencies we work with, the companies have to have some path to financial viability, right? It doesn't make sense for us to invest in great technology and have that company go out of business in three years. That doesn't help our customers, right? So, so we do look at the financial prospects of a company when making an investment decision, but we have a lower bar for that than the traditional financial investors uh, uh, would do. At the end of the day, all the employees here at Enkitel are measured on uh, uh, um, uh, what we call solution transfer metrics pilots, adoptions, the impact of the, those things were not measured on the financial return of our investments uh, 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 because that's not our motivating force and we're very clear with everybody on that. So can we talk, can we build off of that sure. and just talk about risks that yep. these companies face? And I'm not talking about you know financial risks or risks with their technology, but once a company becomes of interest to the U.S. government, yep. others become interested in the company for right. obvious reasons, right? Not, most of them not good. Does Incutel play a role there in, in helping these companies understand the risks that they're facing that, you know, they might not if it was just consumer? Right. So, so we start even before we make an investment. Uh, um, uh, in order for us to make an investment, we will do a uh, uh, security profile and security review of, of the companies that we invest in, right? So we will try to identify, you know, where their sources of other investment capital is, uh, what the background of their management team, that, that sort of stuff. Once we make an investment, we will then uh, uh, help the companies do a, a cybersecurity review, you know, uh, uh, in a physical security uh, 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 review. We will brief them on, you know, uh, uh, these may be the threats that are out there. By the way, while the threat profile might be enhanced by the fact that they're an Incutel portfolio company, uh, our adversaries are interested in great technology companies, whether Incutel is an investor or not, right? You know, and I think sometimes Silicon Valley as a, you know, not just the physical location, but a metaphor for all the U.S. Uh, uh, venture capital-based startups uh, 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 there, is a little naive about uh, um, just how active our adversaries are in terms of trying to understand where, what new uh, innovative technologies are, are being developed. And they might try and steal the technology, they might try and buy the technology, they might try and uh, 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 
uh, uh, recruit some people from those companies to come back to China and, and build a similar uh, 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 product uh, 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 there for, for China. So we, we do a lot of briefings and a lot of education. Uh, we run uh, uh, certain services that, that help us uh, uh, identify uh, potential cyber threats to our, uh, our portfolio companies. And uh, uh, we do try and educate them. And, and the companies are generally appreciative of that because once they start getting educated, they, they, start, they take all this stuff more seriously. So h- how many companies do you look at in a year? Right. So in a given year, we, uh, we create over a thousand meeting notes. We create a meeting note for each individual company we invest in, you know, uh, uh, that basically sort of says, here's what the company does, here's what we think of it, uh, uh, here's what its next steps are, or anything like that. So we meet with over a thousand companies a year to make, you know, on average 60 to 70 new investments a year. So it's, uh, you got to, you know, turnover is a lot of rocks, <laughs> right, uh, 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 to find those one uh, 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 jewel that, 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 that you want to invest in. So you've had a, a long and successful track record. Maybe you could share some of the key lessons you've learned about identifying and nurturing promising startups, you know, those especially that, that, that in the national security space. Sure. So, you know, let's talk about that space maybe for a second, if, that, if that's all right. Uh, um, for the first 10 or 12 years I was at Inkytel, we were this lonely voice in this wilderness sort of saying, hey, uh, U.S. government, you should pay attention to these startup companies. Hey, startup companies, you should pay attention to the U.S. government as this you know, sort of emerging market. Uh, uh, and the conversation was really about why each side should care about the other. Last five, six years or so, that's changed. Our space has become hot. You know, and, and there's a phrase called defense tech that people uh, 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 use now to describe it. And what that means is now all of a sudden the U.S. venture capital community is t- treating this as a segment of their business, right? And so you have firms like American, I mean, uh, Andreessen Horowitz creating an investment theme called American Dynamism, General Catalyst call, uh, 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 created an investment practice called Global Resilience, uh, Founders Fund, Lux Capital, uh, uh, Bessemer Partners, um, you know. It, it has become the thing, hasn't right, it? Yeah, yeah. Right, yeah, right, everybody's investing in, in this space. And uh, at the same time on the U.S. government side, it's not just Inkytel anymore, right? You know, there's DIU, there's AFWorks, there's Office of Strategic Capital. Uh, 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 there's a lot of government-funded uh, uh, initiatives to try and uh, uh, drive the agencies to wor- work and in- source technology, work with and source technology from uh, 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 these emerging startup companies. And so uh, um, the, the conversation in some ways has changed from why to how. How do we work together uh, uh, better? And Inkytel likes to believe we continue to have a, 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 a leading voice uh, 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 in that conversation. You know, the observations we would make a, a, about this general space is, is, is a couple things. One is I think people sometimes uh, are too narrow in their definition of what technologies can help the U.S. government uh, by calling it defense tech, which tends to be, you know, uh, companies that only serve the U.S. Department of Defense or only serve global Western democratic uh, 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 governments. And a big part of Inky's cell success has been in investing in what we call dual-use technologies, companies that are being developed for the commercial world as well as the, the, the government world, right? So companies like Databricks and FireEye and uh, uh, companies in the big data analytics space, companies in the cybersecurity space, advanced energy, right? And that's good because one of the challenges for building for the uh, uh, government world is, as we talked about earlier, that procurement cycle, right? You know, and so, if companies are funded every 12 to 24 months, and it takes three to five years for the U.S. government on its own to, to adopt a technology, there needs to be proof points along the way, and you can get those proof points more easily in, in, in the commercial markets. So, so we like to talk about global security investing as the name of the space, right? Because that includes not just uh, a defense first, but uh, uh, um, uh, uh, dual use uh, uh, technology companies. The next thing uh, uh, I would observe in order to be successful in there is you need to be trusted by both sides. You need to be able to go into a government uh, uh, agency and sort of say, hey, you need to pay attention to this uh, 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 emerging sector of uh, uh, technology innovation and be trusted and be welcome, you know, uh, 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 and understand their use cases and their mission cases and be able to make the connection between this technology and their mission problems that they're trying to solve. Similarly, you need to be trusted by the venture capitalists and entrepreneurs to be able to go in and sort of say, hey, you know what? Uh, 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 there is a government market here. It may not feel like it at first. You may have to put some time and energy in, into developing it, but when you win it, it's a great market to win. Uh, 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 and that's a message that we try and deliver over, over and over uh, 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 to them. So, 
you know, the last thing I would say on this space is, you know, when I first got to Incutel, we just invested in Palantir, you know, and uh, got a lot of calls from top tier investors, you know, who are looking at Palantir over the next couple of years, an investment opportunity, and the company's metrics were attractive to them, but they just couldn't get their head around uh, uh, the investing space, right? Uh, and so they didn't, uh, uh, because they didn't understand the uh, government market, so they didn't make an investment there. Well, 10 years later, Palantir and SpaceX were really the two companies that were sort of the big successes you know, in this market. They were worth tens of millions of dollars. Their investors had made a lot of return. And the investors were all of a sudden like, well, I gotta be investing in that space if you can build companies like that, right? And so the investors started to pour money in that space. And so we have now a, a second generation of companies in this space led by Anduril that uh, 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 you know, are trying to solve this problem. And the U.S. venture capital community is watching this to see if there are successes produced by this generation. If there are, I think it will be great for, the, for, for this space in general. So where would you like to see uh, Incutel 10 years from now? What would be your... Right. So I'd like to say, yesterday, Incutel invested just to deliver capabilities. That was you know, deployment of technology and mission and operational environment. Today, we invest to deliver capabilities and insights as we've shifted to this global war on terror, um, from, as we've shifted the mission of the U.S. intelligence and defense community from global war on terrorism to nation state competition with China, the U.S. has started to figure out that it needs to understand where technology is going. Uh, 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 and we think we are able to do that through some of our investing activities as well. Where we want to go next over the next five or 10 years is uh, we think it's important for the U.S. to continue to produce leading technology companies in critical areas of technology. We can't have another situation like 5G where the leading technology in that uh, uh, area was a company called Huawei uh, uh, out of China that China was using not just to uh, support its uh, uh, business success, but it was really using Huawei as a way to protect power and influence geopolitical events around the world. And, and, and there was no Western democratic-based alternative uh, uh, to Huawei that was particularly strong. We can't have that happen again. And so the, where we're going next uh, uh, is we're trying to figure out how we can help uh, 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 create the next great set of either American tech companies or potentially uh, 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 companies based in other Western democratic countries where uh, we're aligning the capital that exists in the U.S. private sector investment community, you know, the hundreds of billions of dollars that they're going to invest in startup companies, in some form or another with uh, uh, all these non-dilutive sources of capital that uh, have been created through legislation like the CHIPS Act and the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, Defense Production Act that's been around for a while. Uh, um, and so I think there's something there. We don't know exactly what it is yet, you know, w w what Incutel's role in that. But we think there's something there to help align these sources of capital to produce the next set of great American tech companies. And that's where we want to play. So in the, in the last minute or so, and this is a question I ask quite frequently because we have a lot of students who listen. Um, what would you tell them about working at the intersection of venture, national security? Well, you know, what would be your... So um, one of the things that really inspires me when I meet with, you know, uh, uh, the generation of kids that are just getting out of college or just getting out of grad school is they all want to be mission focused. You know, they, they, they don't just want a job. They want to be connected to a, to a mission, right? And you hear a lot about uh, 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 missions around climate tech or around uh, 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 healthcare. You know, but I think there is no more noble mission than the mission of the U.S. intelligence community. Uh, uh, and if, you know, the mission of keeping our country safe and secure, uh, uh, because if that doesn't happen, none of these other missions can be accomplished, you know, uh, uh, quite frankly. So I think, you know, uh, uh, one of the great things about uh, 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 this space, if you will, is if you want to pursue that mission, you, your only opportunity is that you used to be working for the gov U.S. government, right? You're working for the military or the intelligence community, and those are great careers. But now I think there's an additional way you can serve this mission, which is working for these great tech companies that are trying to you know, deliver products and services uh, uh, for this space. And I think it's incredibly rewarding. When I uh, interview people uh, uh, to come to work at Incutel, one of the things I always interview for is you know, affinity for mission, right? Because if you're not excited about meeting with you know, intelligence officers and hearing about their you know, mission needs and their mission challenges. And if you're not excited about uh, 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 meeting with tech companies and hearing about their technologies and then trying to figure out how this tech over here can help solve this mission need uh, over here, I don't think you're going to be successful at Incutel because you're not going to be, you're not going to enjoy the, the job enough. You're not going to be uh, excited enough about it. And, and so I think this whole space is, is really interesting and compelling. And, 
you know, I think people are happier and have higher job satisfactions when they can sort of attach themselves to a larger mission as part of their job and not just uh, 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 work for a paycheck. That's great. It's a great closing thought. Steve, thanks for a really fantastic discussion. Thank you, Andy. Uh, as I said at the beginning, it's an honor to be here. That was Steve Boscher. I'm Andy McCretis. Please join us next week for another episode of Intelligence Matters. And you can always reach us at intelligencematterspod at gmail.com. Intelligence Matters is produced by Steve Dorsey with assistance from Ashley Berry and Sophia Rubin. Intelligence Matters is a production of Beacon Global Strategies.